Welcome to this special episode of Democracy Unplugged, a new show under the podcast party umbrella where we attempt to untangle the threads of democratic principles and dissect current challenges. It is my very great pleasure to welcome to South Africa Douglas Murray, international best-selling author and commentator who's never wanted to mince his words and also joining us is someone who needs no introduction in South Africa and also tells it like it is, Professor Onkopotse J.J. Tabane, the host of Power to Truth on ENCA. We'll start off um, with a little bit of a, a look at South Africa. And J.J., you've got some interesting observations about what's been happening in the last couple of weeks. So it's kept going around with you, talking about how the crooks are really digging in at the moment. <laughs> I don't know if you've all seen this. He was saying it's the end of the financial year. The, 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 the Treasury is about to take back what hasn't been spent. And JJ says now is the time that the till is open. Look, I mean, uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I mean, it's a long way since I tried to apply for a job at Cliff Central after being fired <laughs> from Power FM. Let's say I wasn't hired. But anyway, you know, that's what under the bridge. <laughs> Look, the, the corruption is one of our big crises. In fact, South Africa has a multiple, uh, if you like, intersection of crises at this point, right? all underlaid by leadership crisis, right? So whether be it your health uh, system, right? Uh, yesterday I asked uh, Dr. Letlapi, who just uh, jumped ship from the ANC to the Action SA, whether or not our health system has collapsed. And he says, no, it's an exaggeration, so it has collapsed. So I said, maybe it's because I watch too much TV. Because in TV, there's, there's something called the golden hour. In other words, if somebody gets into an accident, within an hour you must have stabilized them, otherwise something wrong may go. Mm. So a couple of people, uh, including two of my staff, were in a taxi accident two days ago in Kruger's door. It was at 8 a.m. The first x-ray was at 2 p.m. The, the, the first doctor to see them was at 4 p.m. Uh, but that doesn't collapse. It's an exaggeration that just collapsed. So forget about the golden hour. That's 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 a luxury, right? Uh, and then on top of that, you say, oh, let's have a national health insurance. Everybody must just be, be lumped together. So there's a there's a multiple crisis, and I'm just making a, an example of the health system, just to 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 to, uh, to say to you, this is where the money was stolen during COVID. And I was just saying uh, to, to Kenny, uh, people thought I'm crazy when I said there's going to be COVID corruption. They said, no, this guy's now crazy, man. I mean, how can people, die? you know, how can people be dying and you steal? They were, they were stealing money of masks, of PPEs, of health workers, etc. Right? And when you thought that's, that's bad enough, the Minister of Health was involved. Right? So that's what I was saying to say there's a culture of doing business via corruption. It, it's a culture. It, it, there's nothing you can do about it until you change the, 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 you change the fish from the head where it's rotting. I, I'm, I'm it, horrified to hear that. Yeah. It's, can I just ask, uh, yeah. what's the, um, when did you see that culture of corruption starting to the extent that it would even get into the medical sphere? No, look, it, 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 it's been there. I mean, it was worse during apartheid, just it wasn't reported. You'd be arrested if you called any minister mm. names. Right now, can call Minister Nancy names tomorrow, mm. and, and he'll lose in court, you know, and they'll just tell him, no, it's his opinion. And those days, the corruption was so bad, and it was on a national scale, remember, mm. uh, declared by the world as crime. But it, has, it hasn't gotten better after 94. It, it probably got worse because we expected better. That's the only way, reason you say it got worse, because mm -hmm. you expected that these people have been shouting to say we need a moral high ground, we need a proper government, etc. Then they come in, and in the first five years, we had already had a big scandal of the arms deal. Let's just remember. Right? It may be easy to just say, oh, it was Zuma, you know, in the last 10 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it started long ago, and it's getting worse. The health one, well, it, it's been happening all along. That's why the health system has collapsed. But with COVID, it it, it, it sort of was brought to the surface. And that's what I always say during COVID, COVID uh, it doesn't make a man. Mm. COVID just shows up who you really are. 
I remember some years ago I was in Georgia, uh, the country of Georgia, not the state, um, uh, when the Russian invasion of uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia had happened. Yeah. And in the immediate aftermath of that, one of the criticisms uh, of Georgia that kept on coming out was the issue of corruption at a state level, at a government level. And there was a lot of work done in Georgia to try to root that out in the period after 2008. Uh, I always add it, it, was, it was successful, but I would say semi-successful. I never forget, I was once on a delegation with some British and American uh, um, colleagues and friends uh, in about 2014 when Saakashvili was uh, still president. And everywhere you went, uh, members of the government would give you copies of a UN report that had been published mm -hmm. that said that Georgia had stopped being corrupt. Yeah. <laughs> and I was slightly suspicious of the number of copies I was given. <laughs> And then I was doubly suspicious one night on leaving the president's residence with this delegation to get into our bus to go back to the hotel to find a bag with another copy of the corruption report yeah. and an iPod, <laughs> which I thought strongly undermined the case. <laughs> um, um, so yes, it is, it is, it is yeah. a problem in a lot of countries, but it can be improved, of course. I mean, yeah. Well, Trump tried to steal the election. Well, he certainly... He's caught for it. Yes, I mean... It's the highest level of corruption. He I agree. the vote. Well, I agree. I mean, to, to not yeah. agree to the peaceful transfer of power is, yes. uh, is devastating mm. in a democracy. It's uh, utterly devastating. And for a 200-year-old democracy, it means that maybe there's hope for all of us who still get there because we're only at 30 years. <laughs> This Western democracy is the sort that comes up um, and, and people persuade themselves, they're intellectuals, and they talk about it, that the that Western democracy is under threat, that the idea of, of, of liberal democracy is at an end, it's reached its uh, zenith and it's all the way down from here. Uh, do either of you feel that that's true? And, and what's coming next if that is true? My view is that this is a perennial question in liberal democracies. Uh, there's a perennial fear that we might be at a cliff edge. Mm. And sometimes, you know, you read opinion pieces, newspaper articles uh, from 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, or, or making that point. Yeah. And then you always wonder, well, there's two ways you can, in, you can pass that. One is that, you know, that is a necessary thing we have in a, in a democracy is, as you said, at least we have the ability to be rude about leaders, we can expose mm. corruption, that's the, the, there, there's an interpretation of it which is that this is sort of the, this is the edge we always need to be on, I, we always need to be aware that we're at the brink, and in a, we probably are always, you know, it's always lived on the edge of a precipice. The other way of interpreting it is that sometimes that doom saying is correct, you know, sometimes the, the person crying that everything's about to end is right. Um, so a lot hangs on that difference. Yeah. But I do in general think that it's, it, it's a sort of necessary and healthy mechanism in the society that, that you should always be aware of that, of the fragility of it at any rate. I mean, that's, yeah. the, that's the... No, I think it's, it's actually worse than that. I think the, the poor are slowly getting fed up. Mm. That's, that's the sense I'm getting from many, and we're talking 60 elections. And if you look at, if you analyze a number of those elections, you will have the same conversations about these guys have had enough time to eat, that are that, that dying of, of, of gluttony, while others are dying of mm. malnutrition. It can no longer be. Mm. Right? And I think that maybe uh, we are going to see a overall revolution where the, the mainstream, people have been there, you know, keeping, uh, if, if you like, the democracies stable in quotes, in other words, not caring really about those who are suffering, right, are, are slowly going to be, uh, you know, taken out, if I'm, if to, to, to mm. use a, a colloquial term. That's the sense that I'm getting. Uh, in other words, people standing up and saying enough is enough. And yet we're here, and we've survived, and you know, JJ, this place is as tough as nails. We've got some extraordinarily pernicious yeah. uh, survivors. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it getting difficult to be an optimist eh, in our in our situation. If you if you look at the, just the unemployment rate, yeah, mm. right, and the youth unemployment rate, it's a time bomb. By the way, the people who always call for 
the end of a regime and use violence as a means, of course, as we were talking about earlier, never never have a plan for what to do after the violence. You know, mm. it's it's a, it's a perennial thing. I mean, I yeah. you know the, at the time of the French Revolution, you know, Louis the Sixteenth is said to have been woken up finally after the disturbances in Paris, and they wake him up at Versailles and they have a big row about who's going to wake up the king. And, um, eventually, you know, hours later, they agree which member of the court should do it. And when he's woken up, he said, "They say there's a re revolution," and he says, uh, "No, it's a disturbance." And they say, "No, Your Majesty, it's a revolution." And people now wonder why on earth didn't he just get out immediately? And the answer is, the, that the world was unused to revolutions. Yes. And, and now, when you hear revolution, you think of the French Revolution. If you'd yeah. have said to Louis the Sixteenth, "It's the French Revolution," um, yeah. it yeah. would have meant something different. But I'm always, and I'm always stunned by the 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 um, um, the, the, the proximity of the, the, the main thing. I was talking about this earlier with the journalist. The, the main thing is that proximity of violence. Whenever the the proximity of violence is a tool in politics, including yeah. including intimidation. Yeah. Uh, whenever intimidation, physical intimidation, journalists, politicians and others becomes part of the acknowledged legislative process, that's when I, uh, yeah. I think... But well, it doesn't have to always to be like that. I mean, there could be a revolution that doesn't particularly, uh, you know, have violence as its intention. Right? I mean, if you look at the Arab Spring, people just were just laughing at those people marching, but that resulted in, you know, the head of state who was being arrogant, being behind well, bars. But that's a, that's a very interesting example yeah. because, I mean, I mean, the interesting thing with the Arab Spring, in a way, was what didn't change. After the Arab Spring? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the tragedies of yeah. recent years, in my view, is that you have, you know, a Tunisian street vendor yeah. gets completely fed up about the just routine corruption and harassment on the streets, sparks a regional and then uh, a wide revolution, but... Uh, the result yeah. of it, maybe you could say... So you think there's a danger that you could overturn what you have that's bad for something worse? Well, well uh, Libya is one example, maybe. Um, uh, Syria, I mean, that's one of the greatest tragedies of our lifetimes. Um, uh, the Syrian uprising had so much hope, and what has it led to? But, you know, 13 years now, yeah. a civil war. And, um, no, I mean, the Arab Spring became the Arab winter, in my view, quite fast, because... Uh, again, I mean, the people who rose up weren't entirely sure what they were demanding, but the people who they were rising up against had a very clear idea of how to put it down. But is there, has there been a revolution in history where people actually had a clear blueprint of what they were going to do I would say, once they uh, overturned? I would say one. Uh, I would say one. one. That's the American one. Revolution. And I say that as a British-born <laughs> person. So this is... This is uncomfortable terrain. You know. I'm often asked, I live in America quite a lot of the time, and I'm often asked by people there, what were you taught about the American Revolution? And I say, we weren't taught about the American Revolution. And they say, well, what did you think about it? And I always say, I quote the, the, the late writer Jessica Mitford, who used to say, we basically had the impression in England that the Americans had done something bad and we didn't talk about it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I would say that the American Revolution is actually, it, 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 and it still remains remarkable to me, that of the two revolutions going on at that point, in 1789, the French Revolution goes straight to the terror. Why did the American Revolution not? And I believe it's because the founding fathers, who were, I still believe, remarkable men, although a lot of Americans are taught otherwise nowadays, but the American founding fathers really did have an idea I mean, the fact that the first president handed over peacefully to the second and the third and so on. It yeah, but that revolution eventually did not think slavery was such a bad thing. Oh, of course, that's the thing. It had lots of, lots of yeah. uh, flaws in it. But, yeah. the, but the ability to at least come up with a constitution, a Bill of Rights. Yeah. I mean, that, that's one of the things that Hilary Mantel said in her novel about the French Revolution is that the, the, the French Parliament, such as it was, wanted to talk about rights. And she says, but they didn't... They didn't Realize that today you have to talk about laws yes. and rights and responsibilities. and responsibilities. And if you just did rights first, then you'd leave laws for another day. And in actual fact, if you do it that way around, the laws never come. Um, so I know I would still hold so up. What the did the poor revolution. do under this weight of oppression? Because when they try to protest, but no, you don't have a plan for who are you going to replace? They say, oh, there's no alternative. So. It's better the devil you know. No, no, I mean, no, it's, no it's, it's good to have... where we are going to no, be now? Surely it's just good to have an alternative. It's good to have a, 
uh, something you know you're going to do. Yeah. And have a clear, clear idea of it, I'd have thought. I mean, as I say, I mean, the framers of the American Constitution had a... Um, had thought very deeply, all of them, about how you would run a society with a separation of powers and and all of these sorts of things, and and it's held broadly speaking for you know two centuries. Or maybe our expectations were were, were correctly high, that that the, once we get a vote, it's not the end of the story. <laughs> the trouble is that mm. Cordessa made the vote the end of the story right. and said, no, let's just suspend the economic stuff a little bit. Essentially, the economy just remained as it, you know, the structure of the economy remained the same after 1994. It's only the color of the people who have the money. Maybe here and there has changed. There's a sprinkling of a, I think there's a, there's a metaphor for it, of a coffee. I don't drink coffee, so I, you help me. But cappuccino, yeah, you know, sprinklings of black on the top and then the rest is white. But okay, let's not go into the racial thing now. But, but there were compromises at, at, at Cordesa that are coming to ha- haunt us now, yeah. right? Mm. The property thing surely made sure that there's no bloodbath. By the way, I was in the UK in 1993, and the whole country there believed that there was going to be a bloodbath here because there was people who were fighting in KwaZulu-Natal. KwaZulu-Natal is mm. one of nine provinces mm. in a corner of the country somewhere, you know, far away from here. Uh, but but the BB but the but the BBC said this bloodbath is gonna be it's, it's over for South Africa. Anyway, I just wanted to that is it. I I I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. one of several mistakes the BBC <laughs> has made over the years. <laughs> so, no no that's yeah they, they make many mistakes. I mean when we had the World Cup here, which was wonderful. I think there's that there's 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 a, a, a temptation uh, to underplay the, 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 the success of the last thirty years. There are lots of successes. Mm. Do we celebrate the 30 years yeah. or do we say there's so much that, there's, that can, must still be done and that becomes our focus okay. or do we create a balance? Well, I would say it's, it's, a, it's a politician's, it's one of many politicians' tricks <laughs> that, that they can say, then we, if I was a politician speaking of you now, I would say, well, I guess I'm just more optimistic than you. Yes. And it's thought to be a virtue. Yeah. And it isn't a virtue on its own. As I always say, a lot of damage is done by optimists. Um, uh, there's no reason why optimism or pessimism is, is should be loaded positively yeah. either way, yeah. um, and uh, and yes, I mean I think that there's, it's, it's yeah. just the optimism thing is one of those things that optimism politicians. Optimism is a campaign say. tool. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. It is a campaign tool. Uh, Our president just told us, uh, described a, a, a person he called Tim Zwalo. Now this person has has, has been has received all kinds of services since he was one year up to until that thirty years. Yeah. But they, all, they didn't de- define another one who didn't. They just defined this one and right. said, Wow, hooray, yeah. yes, this Tim Tualo, this wonderful South African person who has been born during democracy. Mm. And that's a wrong approach because actually that's not a sample right. of the majority <laughs> of the lived experiences of, yeah. of the people. And we need to be able to yeah. say that uh, and not of, sort of sort of try to tilt the scale to say yeah. don't complain too much etc because the same people who you are saying don't complain are the ones who are drowning in pit latrines I don't even know whether you understand that at all um, you know who sleep that? under bridges yeah. right right uh, who yeah. are given three 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 pounds okay I'm trying to make you understand yeah, yeah, yeah. three pounds it's three fifty right? it's three yeah. pounds it's my calculation all right they're giving three yeah. pounds to survive. Literally, there's yeah. about 10 million people who are given three pounds by the government to say, go and see what you can do. And there are about 26 million who are on social grants. Right. I don't the know what they are called. In... The and, that's, and the government should be proud of that. They should be creating jobs so that not so many people are reliant on handouts. Right. So where does South Africa fit into the world? Because the world is changing in, in remarkable and, and sometimes frightening ways. Um, and we're trying to see where we fit in, not just in terms of foreign relations, not just in terms of who we trade with, but there are population movements going on all over the place. And you come under a lot of flack for talking about immigration, but it's something that we also have to face in this country. We've had xenophobic attacks. Absolutely. You've addressed. Um, people all over the world are trying to define what it is that makes them a nation, mm-hmm. and then how that nation should interact with other nations. It would be curious to know what people think of South Africa becoming a secondary policeman of the world, going to the ICJ, fighting the big boys. Well, um, 
uh, I, I want to preface this by saying that um, uh, a Dutch friend of mine once some years ago arrived in London to stay with me and he said, uh, he said, what are people in uh, England saying about the Netherlands these days? <laughs> I had to say, I had to summon up all my politeness to say that it wasn't on all of our lips all of the time. Um, so, Understand? I, I would just, I just put that out there. Everyone went, what are people saying about me? Uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe they have other interests. Um, well, the ICJ thing has obviously thrown this country into a spotlight. Mm. Um... And, I mean, we'll see how it shakes out as an international trick. Do you think that's a good idea? I think it's a terrible idea. And uh, my view is that uh, it's fairly clear, and I'm sure the paperwork will come out someday, that the government here was pushed into doing it by Iran. Um, sure. Uh, I think your foreign minister travelling to Tehran, and this seemed to me to be an instruction. And with 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 a, with a really horrible horrible undertone, of course, which is that the moral capital which this country has had since apartheid was overthrown was being bought by the Iranians to use. Is that a fact? The Iranian story. We'll we'll, we'll see. We we'll see whether it's a fact or not. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a very surprising thing to do without somebody pushing the government into it, or giving incentives, let's say. It could be, it could just as easily be uh, Moscow, which does, of course, love making international trouble. Um, uh, but, or it could be Qatar involved as well, which has got a lot of money. I doubt it would be Moscow, around. because they would be in the firing line themselves about, mm. about shooting missiles next door. Uh, they're in quite a lot of firing lines already. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but... I, I mean, I would say that it was a, a, a big misjudgment to be seen to be doing that. Um, if you think of the Iran question, would you, on, on do you think the world should have been doing some, not South Africa, but the United Nations, the Security Council, the European Union, all of those bodies, including the African Union for that matter, saying these 30,000 people just dying like flies, you know, or on the 7th of October... One thousand people and being, you know, you know, you know, killed and taken over and, and, and whatever hostage, etc. Surely the world should have been doing something. Eh? Have we become so, let's say, well, so numb uh, to to any pain that this kind of thing can be, uh, you know, allowed to just carry on and the world just sort of sort of thinks, oh well, those people will sort themselves out. Well, I, I would. I'm not. I can. I'll engage in the substance of the Israel bit in a mm. moment, but let me just preface it by something that is by no means what about her. But mm. if it is the case that this country's government cares so much about the suffering <laughs> of the world, mightn't it have been very busy on other things as well? I mean, mightn't they have had something to say about 600,000 people killed in Syria? Mm. Hmm. Might not they have, might they have said Sudan. something about Sudan? Might not they have said something or taken to the International Criminal Court the Fulani militia who I've seen with my own eyes in northern Nigeria slaughtering Christians? One of the most underreported conflicts in the world that has yeah. almost no interest from the international press. When I came back from, um, uh, from northern Nigeria some years ago, I, 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 I kid you not on this, I... I, I I was just so horrified and appalled by what I'd seen and the testimonies I'd got and the people who just yeah. everywhere in Plateau State and elsewhere the suicide bombing at the church on Easter Sunday and children shot as they were running across the fields and just horrible stories everywhere. And I went back to London and I called an editor of one of the main newspapers and I said, uh, this story has to get out. And do you know what I was told? I was told, we already have a story about Africa this week. <laughs> and if I remember rightly, the st story was something happening in Johannesburg. <coughs> now, my point is simply that, I mean, again, I'm not dodging the, the thing I'm saying. The, yeah. the world is so filled with atrocities and wars that yeah. are ongoing. 
Yemen, 300,000 people yeah. killed in the last seven years. So uh, if the South African government had a policy mm. of acting as the world's conscience, they would be very busy. <laughs> What they, we are mentioning things that are too far. Just here in Eswatini, yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. small country. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, a, there's a, a this spot here was killing people. Yes. So the president was there three weeks ago in a gala dinner with that guy. Right. Mm? They were not in court, right? And I actually I said this to say you skip all these countries and go there. However, they, it it doesn't take away from the neglect of the in the, the multilateral system. That multilateral system is toothless. And clearly, it is only betting on the side of those who are well off. I'm sorry. The Security Council is useless, yeah. to say the least. The African Union is toothless, right? I don't know, I'm not going to talk about the regional economic communities because those seem to be at least the ones that are doing something that is useful for the citizens of those particular countries. But what's happening in Israel and in Russia is an indictment on the multilateral system. It means that the, the world leaders could not just say, the way they did with COVID, to say, let the whole world stop yeah. right now. And, and, and there's a lockdown. That didn't take months. That took, that took days mm. <laughs> before the world could stop and say, we're all under threat. So we're going to lock down all the countries. Yeah, but I mean, the whole world isn't under threat after Russia invaded Ukraine. I think part of the international system is under threat, for sure. Um, uh, but, I mean, I mean it's... it's it's a matter of geopolitics, that. And even in Europe, there's divisions about... I mean, I'm very much on the, the side of the Ukrainians, who I hope very much push back the Russian aggressors. But, uh, I mean, there are countries in Europe that, broadly speaking, aren't on Ukraine's side, even though it's a neighbour. Um, uh, my view, is, as for Israel, I mean, I think that there is a cost to starting a war of aggression. And... Uh, if the South African government was interested in prosecuting war crimes, they should go to Cape Town and seize the members of Hamas living in Cape Town. Wouldn't well, that be a good place to start? Members of Hamas in Cape Town. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a good. It would be a good place to start. Yeah. Because if you and there is no law in war that I know of, which says you're allowed to start a war and then when you begin to lose it, you can call for a ceasefire. I mean, I don't think that's yeah. and. Uh, so uh, you know, the, and, and the, I, I don't believe that the I don't I genuinely don't believe that the international community yeah. that has been shouting about Israel's response is genuine in it. I think that they are that they use as they have done for a generation. They use the Palestinians as a pawn in a regional game. Um, yeah, the, I saw again yesterday an interview that Christian Amanpour did with uh, Queen Rani of Jordan, who is not one of my favourite queens. <laughs> who, um, who said uh, who, who I once saw I, was on, I once saw her at a, a Google Ideas Festival in uh, the UK and she was being interviewed by Eric Schmidt of Google it, it, there's nothing funnier than seeing somebody from Silicon Valley meeting a royal of your, your highness your, your mm. majesty, your etherealness and to the slathering it was just yeah. endless and it was after Brexit and the election of Trump, and he said things like, what advice would you give us in our democracies? To... <laughs> and, and I wanted to shout out, the only advice she's got is marry a king. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but, but I'm not being, I'm, but I'm, I don't want to be unduly cruel when I say that, I mean, she has been on the airwaves shouting about the Israelis and again in recent days. And nobody ever asks her what her father-in-law did to the Palestinians. Much, much more relevant. Like, if, if you don't like the Palestinians being mistreated, maybe you should speak to your family. Um, uh, uh, King Hussein. King Hussein. Uh, he had a, a, the same thing with uh, the, the Syrians. I mean, they're not in a position at the moment to pose as moral arbiters, so doubtless they'll try again soon. Uh, a friend of mine was debating against one of the, uh, the, the Syrian foreign ministers just before the Arab Spring on the, yeah. the Syrian Revolution popped up, and the, and the Syrian ambassador to London started talking about the Palestinians, and my friend said, what about Hama? It's a place where the Syrians killed 10,000 uh, Palestinians in a week. Yeah. And my friend said, what about Hama? And uh, this uh, Syrian diplomat said, that is, that is, that is none of your business. <laughs> and my friend said, Look, oh, I thought we were going to get a denial. <laughs> it wasn't a denial. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, 
all wars have to end at the table. Right? We, we, all the sides can, 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 can self-justify as much as they like. But what's happening out there is ugly. Do you, do you think that's true that they have to settle at the table? It has to, but where will it end? I mean, it can be perpetual or there's no war like that. All wars at some point, either it will end at the table or it end as with, as with another three tripping annexed by the other. I don't agree. I, I think the history of warfare is that, that most wars finish because one side wins and one side loses. And the, and the, but the crucial thing is that the side that's won knows that it's won, the side that's lost knows that it's lost. I mean, Imperial Japan was probably the hard, one of the hardest, most radicalized, most um, impossible to bring to the table uh, parties in any war. Yeah. And who would have thought? I mean, no Japanese person could have imagined. They would say they would die rather than see it. Yeah. The, the emperor, God on earth, signing the surrender. Now, that was when the war ended. And that was when Japan had the opportunity to grow into the successful society that is to, it yeah, is today. It is. So are you saying Israel must continue doing what it is doing, in, I, in simple terms, uh, no, no. or must it stop and go and negotiate? Uh, I, th I have a very st straightforward one of this, which yeah. is uh, they, uh, their ambition is to destroy Hamas. Yes. It seems to me a good ambition. Um, whether they can achieve it militarily is an is a interesting question. Yeah. Um, uh, but the, I mean, it seems to me impossible. It, it seems I've been yeah. in Israel for a lot of time since October. It seems to me impossible to live beside people who say they want to annihilate you, uh, do everything they can to do so, then say they'll do it again and again and again. And my yeah. challenge is simply that no country could put up with that. And you, and any country, yeah. this country, if your neighbours were firing missiles into you daily, um, and then made an incursion and killed thousands of your people, and kidnapped your people, I mean. We, 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 we no no normal yeah, society it would like accept what this. What state did, but we still managed to sit at the table in nineteen ninety four, because there were people who were saying no, we can't sit at the table. These people killed our people. They didn't even kill us. Our own, uh, they killed our relatives in the remain sure. in the neighboring countries. But at some point, you have to stop the bloodshed. No, I agree. Uh, am I too much of an optimist if I say that? I, no, not an optimist. I, but I would just say that um, yeah. if you're suggesting. It's it's rather like um, a lot of things that we do. I I think it's very hard to tell somebody else how to put their life on the line. I think it's extremely hard to say to somebody else, look, you're living beside some people who want to destroy all of your people. All of your people. But I think you should try and live with them. I think yeah. that's too I think much. That's what, that's what people. That's what white people told black people. Yeah. Well, after they were being mad at for decades. Remember the seventh. The seventh October is not when the war started. Even there, there well, when a do long, you think it, it did start? I don't know, but it, it it started long ago. All I'm saying is, at this point, it it doesn't help anything for the war to continue. That's really. What I think I it does. Do. I think I think I think that as Benny Gantz, who's a left wing leader in Israel, yeah. said the other day, there's no point in putting out three quarters of a fire. Must put it up all. You've got to put out a fire. If your house yeah. is burning down, nobody says, let's just put out three quarters of this fire. Uh, See if yeah. the rest of it burns the house down or not. You, you, you put yeah. the whole thing out. In, in many struggles, you'll find that the, 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 the oppressed parties are fractured. Here we had Azapo, PAC, AWB on this side. Thing. <laughs> you understand? And then, you know, they, 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 uh, the clerk could have said, who should I talk to? I don't know who to talk to. He said, oh, well, you're going to talk to everybody. But can I throw one thing into the mix, which is, in my experience, a country that has been through a terrible thing like this country yeah. has, both has an insight and doesn't into other conflicts. I, and I, let me do this by turning around on my own country of birth, Great Britain. Uh, we had a uh, uh, conflict for 30 years in Northern Ireland. It was very brutal, very bloody, going on all the time I was growing up. And uh, it finally settled at the table in 1998 yeah. when the two sides were kind of burned out and had become gangsters. Yeah. <laughs> but I tell you this, the, the, the species of person I loathe the most in the world is the British person who travels around the world telling other people how to solve their conflicts because of Northern Ireland. It's a very special yeah. type of 
I think it's a hustle, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a very special type of hustle. And they turn up in, like, Lebanon, and they say, they speak to Hezbollah, and they say, and they go, <laughs> well, we came to the table, and you should be like us. And first of all, yeah. maybe the Lebanese don't want to be British, yeah. first of all, interesting thought. And secondly, maybe it's different, wildly different. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and I think that it might be the case of this country as well, that you have an insight into, into, into things, you have an insight into depression, you have an insight into those things, but not everything will end as apartheid did, just yeah. as not everything will end as Northern Ireland did. Yeah. And we can't expect that that will be the case in other countries. Yeah, I think it's a, que it's a question of, uh, for me, it's a question of principle, to say whether we want to build a kind of world where if I disagree with you, I should just shoot you out of the world. Well, no, I mean, nobody like, wants that. So if we don't want that, if nobody wants that, then we, what do we do to work towards a world where people can actually minimize conflict? I suppose that's why you actually had the League of Nations in the first place yeah. after the World War, and that's why you eventually graduated, or I don't know whether yeah. so we got worse or demoted to the United <laughs> Nations system, right? So I think this multilateral systems, whether be it the global south, global north, or whatever, are meant to, in a sense, engender co cooperation. Right? And while they are caught up in so much trying to engender co collaboration on politics, they, they forget the economics. But, Hence, but, my first point that says the poor are now getting the hard fall, getting the end of the stick. That, that's all I'm saying. I'm not but, saying that the conflicts will be identical, no. but I'm just saying that there, there, there's, 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 there seems to be a broad sense in the world that the war path, right, is not the preferred path. But that isn't the preferred I mean, I much regret yeah. the situation, but I don't think that is the preferred path, or at least, yeah. you know, the, um, is rather like one of Aesop's fables, you know, that, that, that um, some people continue bet to behave like a scorpion, even if they promised you they weren't. Yeah. And, um, I, I mean, I... Uh, obviously, I mean, most of us wish that the that the world was in perpetual peace, and most of us <laughs> realize it probably will not be. But I, I, what I'm interested in is, I, I think, yeah. I think what you're describing, and it's a slightly different um, paradigm to the way I see the world. But I think what you're describing as well is is to be on the side of people who are perceived to be oppressed. Generally, yes, yes, right, and I. But that's not how the world. Now. No, no, no. But I would just say that I would say two things to that. One is, I, I, I think the oppressor oppressed narrative about Israel is wildly incorrect uh, from, from this country. I, I, I think that a country that's small and surrounded by hostile nations is not the oppressor. But uh, once you go into oppressor oppressed, you also have to, to, to try to work out why. I mean, my view is what we should do is to punish um, illegal aggression. It's one of the reasons mm. why I would like to see Russia pushed out of Ukraine. Mm. Um, you know, Russia shouldn't have started the war, and they shouldn't have seized territory by force. I mean, I was with the Ukrainian army when they retook Kherson and Mykolaiv a couple of years ago, and I was filled with enthusiasm that the Russians were going to be on the run and they would have to pay a price for their aggression. But uh, that 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 hasn't happened quite as well as I'd hoped. But but I, I would see it as being that that illegal, um, unwarranted aggression. Mm -hmm. Should should be punished, which is why I'd also like to see Hamas punished. But 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 I just add one other thing to that, which is it is very interesting to me that I come back to this question of as it were where the alignments are going. I, I mean, you can see where some of the alignments are going because very few countries out of some countries in the non-aligned group, some countries who are just very favourable to Russia, very, most countries in the world, um, particularly in the Western world, want uh, Ukraine to win. They want them to win, and they want Russia to lose, because Russia shouldn't have started the war. And nobody wants the precedent of Russian tanks being able to roll over borders without being pushed back, because the 20th century, we had too much of that from Russia, uh, and indeed from anyone. So that's, that's the paradigm that people are working on there. I just find it very interesting, the two wars I've covered in the last two years. Mm -hmm. Nobody was saying to me, ah, the Ukrainians have killed too many Russians. So, uh, questions. <laughs> Where are we going now? So I watched with great interest two conversations of yours, Douglas Murray, that the Hoover Institution conversation and the Monk debates with Malcolm Gladwell. And Malcolm, having sold, sold nearly five million books and quite rigorous in, in his thinking, 
the conversation devolved into some of an, an emotional space that sort of retarded logic. Mm -hmm. And if you and Malcolm Gladwell find yourself in a situation where one party in Gladwell devolves, how can we bring ordinary people who haven't written five million books to have a healthy conversation? Because in my research around emotions, emotions take us to dark places even when we'd like to have better conversations. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing it everywhere. Mm -hmm. You see the brightest people from Palestine and the brightest people from Israel in a conversation who just devolve. Mm -hmm. How can we set a stage and put frameworks and structures in place in conversation and put environments in place to have better conversations? Uh, the, 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 the debate you referred to, the monk debate in Canada, uh, caused a certain breakdown in Malcolm Gladwell because he did a podcast, as you know, where he tried to analyse what had gone wrong. And I could have told him what went wrong for him, which was that he didn't listen. And <laughs> I, I know, I mean, it, it's sort of obvious to us that maybe it's a good idea, but that's not obvious to everybody. In fact, it's not obvious to an alarming number of people. Yeah. Uh, I think that if you're an interlocutor with somebody, even if you're debating with them on a stage like that, in a stage set up to disagree and so yeah. on, I think it's a mistake not to listen to what is being said. I think a lot of people, and you know better this than me, your, your work, but I think a lot of people, what they do is they create a version of the person that they would like to go up against. They don't actually go up against the person. And... And then everything devolves because you're having a fake debate. It's straw, like, straw man. It's, it's straw, straw man. man. Is, is exactly straw man yeah. is a good way mm. of thinking of it. it, it it's, um, but uh, and the one thing I would say on that as well is that um, my experience of debating is that you, as well as listening, um, I think you should you should take people at their strongest, and the only way in which it doesn't work and this is something I've thought about a lot, the only way in which it doesn't work is if you completely distrust the motivation of your interlocutor. So I have this, this test of, like, if I'm... If, if uh, I don't know, if we were discussing, for instance, school failure in South Africa, which we could... Yeah. Or indeed, in a lot of other countries. I mean, yeah. it's, it's 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 it remains wild to me that with the amount everyone talks about education as if it's about resources. And as I always say, you look at in New York State, where I live, thirty thousand dollars a year per pupil was being spent in the years of COVID. And for that, we get fifty-one percent numeracy rates, fifty-two percent literacy rates, K through twelve, and this is the world's richest country. Mm. And 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 people say, oh, and the, the teaching unions say we need more money to be poured in. No, it can't be money, because you've got more money than anyone in the world, and you're and you're not educating children. Anyway, the reason I say this is because if we were having a, a discussion about uh, uh, education standards here or anywhere else in the world, but you suspected that I was only doing that because I'm a communist and I want to institute communism. <laughs> and I was feeding you criticisms of the society and you were feeding some to me back. And, and the point of it was that at some point I would be, and the answer is communism. Yeah. If, if you even had the suspicion that that was the case, we couldn't have a decent conversation. We couldn't have a decent conversation. Yeah. And I actually think that you see in the, in the devolving of debate in America, that actually is the main problem, is that both, both political sides I think, think the other the side yes. is going to do something outrageous. Yeah. Like, the Republicans think that the Democrats are going to try to institute communism, and the Democrats think that the, that the Republicans are going to try to institute fascism. And if that's the case, I mean, you, there's nothing you can do. What role do you think blind religious seal plays in contributing to the narrative and does that affect leaders from coming to the table? So we've seen that precedent has shown Anwar Sadat when he tried to uh, initiate... One a, of the great men of the 20th century. Right, initiate a detente with mm. Israel. He was assassinated. He was taken out. Mm. So do you think that blind religious zeal, not just among leaders, but even among the scores of people who tried to frame this as a reverse Holocaust uh, 
how, how big a threat do you think that is? Uh, I mean, I think religious zeal is always one of the biggest drivers of people. And uh, religious zeal can, can lead to great things. And it can lead to the worst things. To the worst things. It's, mm. it, it brings out the best and the worst in humankind. Mm. I do believe that the problem in the Middle East, the destabilization everywhere at the moment principally is caused by the revolutionary government in Tehran. It's, Hamas is their proxy, Hezbollah is their proxy, what's been happening in Syria has been pushed by their proxies, Yemen is one of their proxies, uh, I hope South Africa doesn't remain one of their proxies, but, um, but as long as, you know, and I'm afraid that, that that is a proper millenarian government, I mean that is, there's a leader I know from uh, Europe who some years ago told me that he had a meeting with the supreme leader Khamenei uh, uh, once at a uh, at an international gathering, and he told me that uh, he and his advisor were asked, "Do you want to come to have breakfast with the supreme leader tomorrow morning?" And he said, yes. Um, he went. He said it was one of the strangest encounters of his life. Firstly, because the supreme leader had a choir of clerics behind him, chanting, which most people don't want before their coffee. And <laughs> and, uh, and my friend, to try to break the ice, said through the interpreter, um, what, uh, what do you do first thing in the morning? And he meant literally, like, do you, do you, do you have coffee? Do you have coffee? Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. And it comes back through the translator, the Supreme Leader said to him, the first thing I think about in the morning is how to destroy the Zionist entity. Sure. Uh, so, you know, he's a, he's a zealot. Now, there, is, there can be zealots on every side. The question is whether you celebrate the zealots or not. There was a madman, by the way, there's, there's plenty of criticism in Israel. You should read Haaretz. But um, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a madman in the West Bank uh, some years ago, in the 1990s, called Baruch Goldstein, who went into the holy places in Hebron and killed people. And some years ago, I went out of interest. I was in Hebron, and I said, I want to go and see the grave of Baruch Goldstein. I want to see it. And it was incredibly hard to find. It was covered in dust in the outskirts of the settlement. And I thought, that's a good sign. He's dead, buried, and hopefully what forgotten. Mean? About universities uh, and the, the kind of ideas that are... Um, put out at, at universities, but also the cost of universities, which is a huge issue here in, in South Africa. Uh, for, for many students who see it as a, a way out, but often it's a way out into a, a set of very bad ideas, which is what you cover. But it seems to be the only system for young people who want to better their lives. And I'm just interested in if you think there's an alternative system or, or where you think this very expensive, quite problematic from a political perspective. I mean, UCT just thankfully voted against a, a boycott of all Israeli universities today, but it's not over yet. Um, and, and if that's the level of, of, of what the, the, the teachers, the lecturers are doing, mm. what, what does that say for the future of our, our young people? At the moment, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of both. If we fix education, all the things that we are complaining about here, hopefully the next generation won't have to deal with a lot of them in the mm. same kind of intensity. That's number one. Yeah. Number two, our education system is archaic, right? In other words, I'm going to go to university. Even if I study, right. you know, biblical studies, as long as there's a degree. Right. Whereas with that time that I study biblical, there's nothing wrong with biblical studies. Just saying. Uh, it was an easy way. When you get there, they say you can't qualify for medicine. Then you have to look at the next possible thing. You know, I failed my whole first year trying to be a doctor, you know, of medicine. Then my parents, you know, go and study English and, and philosophy. You know, and I passed in flying colors with that, and I did other things, and I became a doctor eventually uh, uh, by back door, not the doctor of medicine. <laughs> I, uh, that's not too, but it's not too productive per se. So our university system must be combined with technical ability and respond to the economy. A lot of businesses are complaining that a lot of stuff that's been taught at universities and even universities of technology or what used to be called technicians, right, mm. are irrelevant by the time the kids leave the school. Right. By the time they get into the public, private sector, the stuff they, bought, they, they were taught is outdated. So you need an integration of the university system mm. so that you can take a route of university but take a, a, a technical route 
but also combine it with the needs of the private sector mm. of where these people are produced to. They are produced to do what? They can't be produced just to be, you know, academically inclined and what. I mean, uh, we understand that you need a knowledge base of a country, but that can be all that you, 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 you chaperone your kids to. The problem here is that half of the kids who uh, start at, at grade one don't finish, half, literally, don't, don't get to metric. I don't know what it's called. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Graduate. E levels yeah. or whatever we call them. So they run yeah. up the first debt for the unfinished degree. No, no, no. Forget about that. They don't even get to the metric where right, you right. can consider them for university. Right, right. So they drop okay, out yes. before high school. Right? right. So that's the, your first problem. Mm. Then second, then when you get into university, then half of the ones who, who go into that university system either can't afford it or if they can afford it, they, they, they study something that's irrelevant for the market. That's why you've got, I mean, the, the latest report was some 800,000 graduates who are sitting at home in a, in a midst of uh, uh, wow. vacancies in private sector where they need the skills mm. and then they can't match it with this unemployed graduate. Uh, do we have a ranking of the least useful degrees? Uh, I've just uh, said one, a biblical just... study. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. It's a good, it's a good, my father is a priest, so I, I hope he's not watching this. But, but biblical studies, they are, it's, it's like there's social sciences where you are just getting in. They just even say, just have a degree, as long as you have a first degree, right? And then a lot of people then end there right. and not progress because that, this, it can also dump you down right. a little bit. Because imagine if you're doing chemistry and suddenly you're doing uh, French or English. You know, yes. you, 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 there's all good distinctions in all the things I yes. did after I did chemistry. But I then take the degree and give it to my parents because that's what they wanted. Mm. And then we went to do law, which is what I wanted. Right. Uh, I once went to an event uh, in London where you said something along the lines of that our generation's current or biggest problem looking back from the future to our generation or era might be that we were still trying to figure out uh, the Second World War and how to deal with it. <laughs> and, and so my question is, is, is there's two things uh, I would like you to elaborate on that. But there's two things that I believe have been, is largely left out from this conversation, not tonight, but in general. And you've spoken about some of this. The one is, is the whole notion of identity and the loss of commonality between people, mm -hmm. leading to mistrust and, and so forth. And the other side of it is, is self-reliance or, 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 or loss of dependency. Because we tend to, when we talk about these type of things, we are very careful not to, to talk too much about things like community identity and things like that because of how it might be perceived. But on the other hand, we tend to spend a lot of time talking about what the government ought to be doing to fix our problems as opposed to what we can be doing within the context of our own community. In some ways, even worse in America because sure. um, the, the debt that people get into is, is so astronomical and, um, and for really for, for degrees which are... Uh, uh, totally pointless, yes, yes. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's 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 an awful. The only thing worse than getting a couple of hundred thousand dollars in debt to do a degree in sociology is uh, <laughs> to get a couple of hundred thousand dollars in debt to get a degree in sociology. When in actual fact, all that's happened in your four years of study is that you've become more malevolent and stupid. And um, <laughs> and I'm firmly of the belief that American universities turn people malevolent. They, they take perfectly nice people who've been brought up perfectly nicely by their parents <laughs> and they make them into grievance mongers and, uh, and uh, the everything is a, everything and everything's about themselves and it's it's and then of course they're unemployable because they're horrible um, <laughs> but uh, but but anyway on the issue of uh, and the uh, your identity is, is is very much linked to that I, I've I've said for a long time that that one of the lessons which the world took from the Second World War was that nations, nationalism, was the problem. Okay? I actually think that's only in part true. My view is that nationalism, as a form of belonging, can go wrong. And we saw it twice in the 20th century with German nationalism. And it can go so badly wrong. But I would I always say but, but, that everything can go wrong. You know, the Trojan Wars were started because of love. And, you know, I mean, of course, love can go wrong. 
Um, I think it's the wrong lesson to take to think that because of German nationalism of the 20th century, national belonging is a bad form of belonging per se. I think it can become terrible when it becomes jingoism or much more. But I would just say that the, the forms of identity which as a result some people, mainly in the West, mainly in English-speaking Western world, uh, have latched onto is because national belonging has been made an illegitimate form of belonging, or one that's sort of rather looked down upon, that other forms of belonging should take its place. So you should identify by your racial grouping, or you should identify by your sex, or if you don't believe that sexes exist, you should identify by your sexuality or your gender identity. And I say, first of all, these might be shallow forms of belonging or dangerous forms of belonging themselves. We just don't know yet. Um, I, I personally have a, a, a loathing of politicians as much when they say, you know, this racial group should vote this way, or, you know, I have an equal dislike when people say women should vote this way. I'm like, really? You're sure what 50% of the species wants? When do you think they should all vote one way? Uh, it seems madness to me. But these forms of belonging have become the forms of belonging in the West and democracies which have taken over. And I think they're shallow. They've sort of replaced religion. I think they're an extremely bad replacement for religion. Um, because at least religion is based on texts that have lasted the space of time. And I'd much rather base a life on the Bible than on Judith Butler or <laughs> some other gender theorist, Robin DiAngelo or... You know, I, I'm not, much, not, just, not to select two particular personal <laughs> You know, I, I, I am known to have said that Israel must hunt Hamas. <laughs> and it was based on the understanding of my experiences in Israel. But I want to speak to this matter that uh, you raised about the ruling party uh, taking Israel to the international court. You see, the, the ANC as a political party has created a culture of buying, of what, what is in it for me. Mm. Um, so the ANC is fading. It has lost support. They know that. The only thing that keeps the ANC alive is that it's a liberation movement. Mm. And the support of the Palestinians still give them that take. Mm. But for the, for the ruling party to take um, Israel to the international court, there was three benefits. Number one, Iran would fund their campaign. Mm. Number two, allegedly, Iran would release the funds of MTN that are locked in Iran. As we know that the president is a shareholder at MTN. Number three, it was a PR exercise leading up to elections. Let us do something that is morally out outstanding so that we can now talk to the radicals, the revolutionaries, and we go into these elections uh, with a clean face. So, it was more of a PR exercise. There was no principle. There was no principle at all. And this is where South Africans are missing it. And that is when now you see the Muslim community saying, we are no longer voting for the DA, we are voting for the ANC. That is now you are seeing radicals saying, it is still a, a liberation movement. Mm. Therefore, we are going to vote for them. So those were the three benefits. I just wanted to clarify very, that. Very interesting. Yes. And my question is, do you think, and it's for both of you, do you think polls are objective? <laughs> do you think polls are anything to take seriously? Because in 2021, we contested uh, local elections as a political party. And we were nowhere in the polls. And the result of that... Uh, local elections put us as, as the seventh uh, largest party in this country with our one percent. Mm. We've won by elections many times 
even in the strongholds of the ANC and the DA. We are still not in polls today. In fact, uh, uh, one of the, or the biggest, the most respected uh, election analyst said that for polls to be able to determine the right, the correct outcome of what's going to happen in 2024, they have to include the Patriotic Alliance because it is the fastest growing political party. That's Wayne Susman. So do you think polls are anything to go by? Should we take them seriously? And with your experience also all over the world, uh, if, if they really work? Thank you. Look, the, uh, there's something called internal polls. You must believe those ones. Yeah. <laughs> because the pe your people are likely to tell you the truth, right? I found that some of the polls, uh, you need to use them as a political organization to, to, to strategize. If you ignore them no. and, and just sort of live in your own world, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, the, the, uh, my friends in the EFF are saying they're at 30%. I'm not sure which poll. No, no, but maybe it's their own internal poll, right? But the Ipsos poll, which has been credible, even though they got the EFF wrong in the first election because nobody knew what the EFF was, right? Um, they, they, it puts them neck to neck with the DA. Now, the DA can go to bed and say, no, oh, these polls are not true, like what Helen Zilla tried to do to discredit Ipsos. When just in the last election, she was quoting Ipsos. When if those are seen, they are they are, they are way. <laughs> so we, we, you know politicians don't you know don't 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 mind to lie openly and and, and quickly, you know. I'm so, shocked. So if <laughs> absolutely so if so, so so my my view is that the polls are a, a, an instrument during elections for your own good in terms of assisting yourself to campaign to know where to look at, because sometimes the polls are extensive. They could even say to you, in this geographical area, you are at zero. So when you campaign, you have to put more resources there where those polls, you don't have a capacity to do the polls. The last thing is, I, I always doubt whether the polls, in a, in a country of 60 million people, a sample of 2,000, I mean, scientifically, and I'm not a scientist, I was, I'm a failed scientist, as I told you. But you've got to have a sample that makes sense. Right. Mm. So if your country is 60 million people yeah. and you come and tell me that you, had, you did a poll of 700 people and I must take you serious, mm. you know, secondly, geographically, please don't tell me that Ipsos has gone to Malamolele <laughs> and poll people in Malamolele mm. and in Kofimvaba. I doubt they will have gone to urban areas and maybe a sprinkling of rural. So, they, so, so in, a, in other words, polls take them with a pinch. Of soul. I think you said earlier that many people in the United Kingdom, United States, Europe, perhaps are not that obsessed with South Africa. <laughs> I think you made a, a comment about the Netherlands. You said, you know, yeah. actually not, not that interested in South Africa. And I think that's true. I think that people were very interested in South Africa when things were going well in the, the mid-1990s. But as mm. things declined, I think the country's become a a bit of an embarrassment for many people who, who hitch their wagon to, to the ANC's narrative. Mm. But I think it's a mistake that people are losing interest in this country. Mm. And the reason I say that is because I think that some of the most pernicious ideologies in the world have been pioneered in South Africa long before they've appeared in the United Kingdom and the United States. We, when you see people tearing down statues on university campuses in the United States, where did that begin? It began here at the University oh. of Cape Town. When you see the American government and, and American corporates start talking about racial quotas in their workforces, we, well, we, we pioneered that in the 1990s, and, and some of the consequences are, are quite, um, quite evident. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if these lights go off in, uh, <laughs> in a few minutes' time. When you see crumbling infrastructure in California, I refer to that as the South Africanization of, of California. I refer to the South Africanization <laughs> of Harvard University. Um, when you see the, the polarization that's happening in, in American society, I often refer to that as being the South Africanization of the United States. Do you think it would be a good idea, Douglas, for, for someone such as yourself, this would absolutely make my day if you were to go and write an article, the South Africanization of X or the South African... You know, I think South you South have the copyright yeah, on that. No, he must, you must write that article. <laughs> do, do you think that the world would be well served by paying closer attention to what is going on in South Africa? Oh, you bet. I mean, it's why I find this country very interesting. Um, I, uh, 
I think you're right. In general, people turn away from stories once they disappoint them, you know. And I suspect you're right that after, you know, the 90s, that the, the people looked away and they hoped that it would go well and they didn't pay much attention, yes. Um, I would just say that what you referred to with the roads must fall thing, yes, my old University of Oxford got some of that, so I actually did pay attention very closely. There was a young South African man who turned out not to be a very pleasant character who led the campaign in Oxford. He said that Oxford was an unsafe space for him because of a statue that way up in this place that no one had noticed for a hundred years. <laughs> and um, and I realised quite swiftly it was all to do with him uh, trying to build a political career here, uh, you know, and um, make noise. And, of course, the problem was is that, is that you know, the, the, the professors at Oxford had no idea what was going on. Absolutely none. And absolutely horrified that an international student at a university which prides itself on international students and looking after them, their welfare, should be accused of being an unsafe space. I just think that there's, there's a couple of things I'd make an observation about this. One is, there's a great mistake in our time of particularly young people saying, I never knew about X. Or, you know, nobody ever told me about Y. I think, first of all, it, it, you know, the stuff happened before you were born amazingly and maybe you should know about it <laughs> and maybe it wasn't anyone else's job to like just force feed you facts and maybe you wouldn't have been very good at listening to them anyway so um so for instance when that movement began when i was at oxford nelson mandela came to oxford and in a special ceremony they became the mandela Rhodes scholarships yeah and this young man seemed not to know this and most of the people commenting on it didn't seem to know this. So I was just saying, if it was good enough for Mandela to put his name to <laughs> the scholarship to scheme, name Cecil Roads, Rhodes, that this young man was benefiting from, of course, um, then maybe it's good enough for him. And But of course, it's a very easy way to blindside people. You come at them at such force, making such allegations, that you terrify them. And you, they're, they're sort of stuck like rabbits in the headlights. They don't know what to do. But so, so I think there's a, there's a huge problem with that. But the second thing I would say about this is it's, it's a terrific diversion, the whole thing. You know, I said after the Democrats lost the 2016 election and they went really big on identity politics, I said there's something slightly Marie Antoinette-ish about it. Instead of let them eat cake, it's let them eat identity politics. Let's feed them identity politics. And it's the same with things like statue toppling. You know, um, in America, there's been this mania of statue toppling. Uh, um, and, and you say, what does any of this do for the people in America today? And the answer is, if not nothing, very nearly nothing. But what it does do, and this is what I do suspect, although I'm a guest in your country, maybe I can say this, is what I do think the South African government is doing with the ICJ and things, which is, if you, if, in my observation, politicians who, who become incapable of doing the basics start to do grand things. You know, we will eradicate... Well, my favourite one at the moment is they've moved on from poverty, apparently they've solved that. My favourite one now is, no, no, even better than climate, you get politicians saying that we're going to stop hate. <laughs> Justin Trudeau in Canada is very big on this. He, the Canadian economy goes like this. Um, they're going to have the South Africanization of Canada. And, and, and what does Justin Trudeau say? He says, I'm going to get rid of hate. I was in Canada the other day. I said, what's your Prime Minister going to do after he's got rid of hate? Will he do gluttony? <laughs> Will, will he solve envy? Maybe he could do lust. I say he's the only politician I've ever seen who's split up with his wife to spend more time with himself. Um, but, but, uh, but, you know, it, it, it's preposterous. But you only start talking in those terms. We're going to eradicate hate. We're going to, we're going to solve the past. 
We're going to discover that people in the past didn't think exactly as we do in 2024, and we're going to scold them for it. <laughs> That's almost always, in my view, the sign of failing to provide education, yeah, basic, basic yeah. services, improvement, to make sure that this generation growing up has a better life than their parents, not a worse one. I see it as being a smoke screen, or as it's sometimes called a woke screen, it's, I, think it's, I, think, I think it should be a big, red, flashing yeah. warning light. Mm. I think that we've got lots of good exports around which people can label South Africanism somewhere, right? Mm. Uh, including reconciliation. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, it's, it, it, it's not perfect, but, you know, it's not like you, you have a racial incident every day for the last 30 years. Actually, you had a lot of calm over the years. That's why when there's a racial spike... You know, the whole country sort of gets into a frenzy because mm -hmm. that's an exception, not the rule, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that we need to celebrate yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we gotta celebrate that because remember, when I was in, it was it's called uh, da Dharam, or is that the Dharam? Dharam yes. yeah. College, yeah. yeah, I spoke there, 1993. Right? Everybody I met, in Dharam, there, there were no black people in the buses. So every person in Dharam was looked at me as if like I'm lost. Uh, in that bus, but it's okay. But they talked to me, and I and they said, "Hey, I understand that your country is going to be in a mess, right?" Mm. And that's why this country is often described as a miracle, right? Mm. But that miracle can the miracles are not sustainable, right? Mm. You got to do something that's not a miracle, which is a, a once-off thing, but something that's sustainable, mm. right? So I think that the the, the the going back to the optimism thing. Optimism has to be coupled with work. You've got to be optimistic, but work. So because hope is not a strategy. And unfortunately, all these politicians are selling us dreams and hopes. Right? Uh, half of them have not laid a brick in their lives. They have not run anything. They haven't established any business. But they want to run the whole country. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how they're going to do it. At least Kenyans run a business. <laughs> so, so couple of our optimism with work. Hard work. Really nothing can replace just hard work. Yeah. Right? And then a framework. Lastly, identity politics. Unfortunately, those are going to be a lifelong, a lifelong diet to chew on. You can't run away from it because... You know, it, it was a mess for too long for it to be fixed in 30 years, mm. right? So here we're talking black consciousness. Somebody could say, no, well, that's racist. It's not. Right? It depends how you define that black consciousness, mm. right? Or just consciousness. Because without consciousness, you're going to have a situation where the president can stand up and say, oh, by the way, if you don't vote for me, people are not going to get social grants. And get away with it. Mm. A total lie on TV with mm. every, the whole world watching. And he just says, if you don't vote for us, these 26 million people who are on social grants are going to go hungry. Right. And I, I, I've, there are very few people who have taken him on, including in his own party. Right? And that's because of lack of consciousness. Mm. We have a thick report like this called the State Catcher Report that lists almost 100 people in the ruling party to have been fingered. I won't say corrupt mm -hmm. yet. Fingered and in malfeasance, half of those people are back on, on a list to parliament with nothing having happened to them. Not one of them is in orange overalls or in handcuffs. Yeah. And it just shows you that there's a lack of consciousness. Right? So we need hope, optimism, consciousness, but above all hard work to make this country work. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. What's that, JJ Thank you. Thank you very much, Douglas Murray. Thank, Thank you. you very much for coming. The Podcast Party is an online content hub where open dialogue and critical thinking are encouraged, where great minds don't all think alike. Subscribe on our YouTube channel and follow on social media at Podcast Party SA.